Good evening. Uh, I'm John Henry, uh, Chairman of the <clears throat> Committee for the Republic. Uh, tonight, uh, I have the honor of welcoming back one of our most popular and engaging speakers, Hedrick Smith, a former reporter for the New York Times. Uh, the topic uh, Rick will address could not be more timely. The evils of the Republican Democratic Party duopoly uh, that begets to toxic politics and manipulates electoral rules to shield against would-be third parties and suppress wide-ranging debate. On the surface, there is a appearance of rivalry, uh, not collusion, uh, as the impeachment of President Trump yesterday suggests. But the rivalry has become a game about capturing or securing an imperial presidency. Democrats and Republicans have turned the Constitution upside down, dismantling separation of powers, encouraging Congress not to do its job, concentrating power in the executive, and politicizing the courts. Both parties are bought by the military contractors, too big to fail banks, big pharma, and the 1%. You may remember uh, the 2012 salon we had for Rick um, and his uh, groundbreaking book, Who Stole the American Dream, which detailed the destruction of our middle class. Tonight's speaker is a strong believer in change that comes from the bottom up. I first met Rick uh, when he was a Neiman Fellow, and I was uh, back in 1970, and I was a uh, Harvard undergraduate. Rick is a great reporter. He went on to head the New York Times Washington Bureau and win the Pulitzer Prize. Rick has applied his strong repertorial skills in his second career as a uh, documentary filmmaker. Rick has focused on what he calls uh, the democratic, the demo, demo, democracy rebellion. Uh, an interesting term. Um, uh, Rick's serious grassroots reporting is focused on electoral reforms across the uh, many states ballot access, gerrymandering, winner-take-all winner, winner take all elections, campaign finance. Rick, uh, uh, turn it over to you. Please tell us now how we can pump some oxygen back into our electoral process. Well, John, first of all, let me thank you for having me here to give this chat, and it will be a dialogue, uh, I'm sure. Uh, I've enjoyed being a participant in the Salon and the work that you have done, the speakers you've brought in, the dialogue that you have created. And I have to say, as somebody who spent time at the Council on Foreign Relations and various other groups uh, that have uh, dialogues about public policy and our politics, that I've found the Salon a rich vein of different viewpoints that has really been both entertaining and educational. So I take my hat off to you. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about Thanks, parties, uh, and I'm going to pick up from the salon you had a couple of weeks ago from Lee Drutman, who was really talking about the need for um, a third party or fourth parties or other parties. I'm going to go back to behind that comment and talk about our two major parties. And I know many people, uh, I'd like to distinguish between the insurrection of January 6th and the democracy rebellion I'm talking about, which is peaceful, it's around the country, it's Americans who are upset at the way our political system is dysfunctional and not working. They're upset at gridlock. Uh, <coughs> they're upset at the almost monolithic blocks that the parties have become. I can remember when I first came to Washington in the early 60s, uh, and political scientists at that time used to make charts blocking the party votes of the members of the House of Representatives. And you saw conservative, Repub conservative Democrats over on the chart somewhere among uh, you know more liberal Republicans and liberal and moderate Republicans mixed in you know, with Democrats and so forth. Uh, there was no clear blot. And over the years, if you watch what political scientists have done, you now see two very distinct blocks and there's a white no man's land between them. So the old overlap is gone. Uh, and you really have uh, what people call warring tribes um, and you have with that a lot of concentration of power. Uh, the leaders have gained more power as the parties have become more monolithic. I don't want to claim they're monoliths, but they become more monolithic. Um, and I think there's a lot of argument in Washington 
uh, about why this is happening and what to do to break it up. And it's a lot of Washington people inside the Beltway talking to each other about inside the Beltway stuff. Over time, I came to believe that it wasn't going to get fixed inside the Beltway. Uh, it was only going to get fixed if we went out uh, into the country and saw what people could do in the states. And it's interesting. The problem of parties is obviously an old one. The founders feared the rise of party tribalism. They didn't call it parties. They called it factionalism. Uh, in the Federalist Papers, but they were worried that factionalism would paralyze their preciously, uh, carefully constructed system of divided power. And that's exactly what's happened. And you get people like Mickey Edwards, I don't know if you all know him, but a 14 term Republican Congress from, from Oklahoma, who is, uh, and he wrote a book a few years ago called The Parties Versus the People. And I've got, a, I've got a YouTube channel called The People Versus the Politicians. It's very similar. Uh, and another recent book, which gets into it, uh, which I think your members will, uh, our members will uh, find interesting, is a book about the party duopoly. It's called The Politics Industry, written by a Harvard Business School professor, Michael Porter, and a co-author, Catherine Gale. And they actually try to take apart the political system of America, the party system, and look at it as an industry, as if it were an economic duopoly. And what they find is that, in fact, it operates very much the same way. It operates to block competition. They operate with common interests. Uh, they fight each other, but they do it in ways that, that actually help each other survive. Now, let me give you a couple of quotes from the book, because what was interesting to me when I first saw the book is how closely they were describing the political system uh, to the way I was describing it, except they use a bit of business school terminology that I didn't use. The dysfunctions of the po politics industry are perpetuated by unhealthy competition. This is Porter and Gale speaking, and barriers to entry that secure the duopoly's position regardless of results. Our political system will not correct itself. There are no countervailing forces or independent and empowered regulators to restore healthy competition, unlike the economy. The rivals, this is nice, the rivals differentiate themselves by dividing up voters according to ideological and partisan interests. Fine. Now they're talking about them as businesses. They target mutually exclusive groups of partisans and special interests, customers, in order to minimize overlap of core customer bases. This division enhances customer loyalty and reduces accountability. Each competes to reinforce the division by demonizing the other side, we just saw it the other day, instead of delivering practical solutions that would most likely require compromise. The greatest barriers to entry include party primaries, plurality voting, and a partisan control legislative process. So this is a system that we've become so accustomed to that we don't really take a look at it and understand how it's operating and how we've become imprisoned, enmeshed in this system. We see the outcome in Washington and sometimes in the States, and we don't like the outcome, but we don't get enough outside of our own assumptions, our own political assumptions, which incorporate the party system, we don't get outside of enough to look at things like sore loser laws and party primaries and say, what is this doing to political power? And how is this disenfranchising voters? And how is it limiting voter choice? Party primaries, 85% of the seats in the House of Representatives are decided in the primaries. That's the decisive election. Party primaries are the central architecture of the duopoly. Can't operate without them. They are the gateway. And the interest of every sitting politician, with almost no exceptions, is to make sure that they win that party primary. That's the keyhole. That's the eye of the needle through which they have to pass. That is the gatekeeper. That is the, the point of discipline. They are the building blocks of the parties. 
they exclude and prevent competition because they've become so powerful. It's very hard uh, for the Green Party or the Libertarian Party anywhere else, except maybe in a state like Alaska, which actually has six active political parties, but makes it pretty impossible for anybody to compete. It disenfranchises the largest body of voters in America. We now have more independent voters not affiliated with a party than we have Democrats or Republicans by a good shot. Independents are up around 40% and the parties are, you know, flip around 28 to 33%. It varies a bit, okay? The party's primaries have extremely low turnouts. We're talking about turnouts that can run as low as 2% of the electorate to five or 10%, very typical. Remember Terry McAuliffe not too long ago when he ran and became the nominee of the Democratic Party for governor of Virginia? It was a 4% turnout. And those tend to be very regular voters and it fuels extremism and the political apparatchiks, the campaign and media advisors and the fundraisers are all keyed in to this very narrowly based system. And it's also a system which allows for disciplining the big word in American politics today, when you're talking about party discipline is, if you don't go along, we'll primary you. The primary has become a verb, it's become weaponized. And that tells you how important it is and how central it is to the political system and imposing discipline, okay? All right, uh, if you all wanna go talk about that, we can, why that's that way, but let me, share with you what I've learned from uh, going around the country, talking to people and actually watching what's going on. And in states as different as Florida and South Dakota and Connecticut and California and North Carolina uh, and Washington State and a whole bunch of other states in between. I think gerrymandering, yeah, I think a lot of people, myself included uh, several years ago, I really felt that money in politics was the thing we had to cure, uh, that money was the, the biggest corrupting force. And it certainly is a big force. But I actually think that our system is probably more distorted, more dysfunctional, uh, and more disabled by the duopoly of the parties. And the question is, can we do anything about it? And the answer is, yes, we can. And what's amazing is, ordinary people whose names you have never heard of and who've probably never been given any media attention outside of their own states have actually been doing amazing things. Gerrymander reform to break the monopolies of the election districts. Now we're back to that 85% of the house seats are safe seats. And if you're the, if you're the, uh, Republican legislature in Pennsylvania. You not only create safe seats for your party in rural and some suburban districts, but you concede safe seats and you jam as many Democratic voters as you can into them in the center of Pittsburgh and in the center of Philadelphia and maybe one or two other cities like York. But so there are safe seats on both sides. The gerrymander is, you know, for the Democratic Party in Maryland. They grab eight seats for themselves and they cram as many Democrat, uh, Republicans as they can into that one seat that they're willing to give the uh, Republican Party. And the Republicans used to have two seats, Democrats in Maryland have become even better at gerrymandering now. And, and so they've gotten it up to, they cranked it up to eight out of nine seats they get by gerrymandering the state. And the state has a Democratic tilt, but a normal count would come out with like, uh, maybe six to three or five to four in favor of the Democrats. What's amazing is, listen to, listen to what happens when you have gerrymandering. Ohio is a state that runs, it's got one Democratic senator, one Republican senator. Uh, the, House, the governor's races and the presidential races are decided normally by three or four percentage points. House delegation from Ohio for years has been 12 Republicans in four Democrats. This time it's actually uh, 11 and 5. So the Democrats have improved a bit. But think of that. It's almost a three to one advantage. And that's all gerrymandering. Uh, you know, uh, for a long time, North Carolina uh, was 10 to 3. And the guy who was doing the gerrymandering down in, in the 
uh, North Carolina was asked at one point why it was 10 to three. He says, cause I can't figure out any way to get to 11 to two. You know, I, I can't, I can't squeeze any more out of the system than that. You know, in Texas today, it's 24 to 13. In Florida, it was 17 to 10 for a while. In Pennsylvania, before gerrymander reform, in Pennsylvania, 18 seats in the, in the House, 13 Republicans, and five Democrats. And, and that was even in elections when there were more votes for the Democratic candidates for the House than there were for Republican candidates. That's how, that's, this is not a matter of, oh, we all live here and there. Yeah, there's a certain amount of that, but it's minor. This is, there's a, the experts I've talked to reckon there's at least at the moment uh, uh, a 20 seat gain by Republicans uh, because they've been so much smarter about uh, gerrymandering than Democrats. They had a program, actually, uh, Kyle Rove and a bunch of very smart Republicans got together back in, in 2010 after they lost the presidential race to uh, Obama. And they put together what they call Red Map, which was a, a, a program designed to go win as many key tippy seats in state legislature as possible, to flip as many state legislative chambers as possible so they could control the redistricting process in 2011. And they were enormously successful. They flipped control of 12 legislative bodies across the country. They picked up 675 legislative seats because the Democrats weren't even paying attention to that level of competition. Now, what's interesting is to go back to Pennsylvania as an example, Gerrymander reform in Pennsylvania has been mandated by the courts by a lawsuit uh, that uh, was filed in Pennsylvania and went up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and they actually imposed a map. And the map was put together by some academic experts to try to make as many districts competitive and fair, not to flip them from one party to another because a really good election system actually makes districts competitive. If you're winning, if you look at those races in Georgia that we just saw in those Senate races, those were ideal. That's giving voters maximum power, enormous attention, very close races, and every freaking vote counts. That empowers voters. That's the goal of gerrymander reform is to make competitive districts so the voters matter and so that after they get elected, <laughs> the candidates have to pay attention to the base at home and go back and make sure that they've kept their, their voters happy or they don't get reelected. But in gerrymandered districts, you don't care because all you got to do is keep that very small percentage happy and uh, they've learned how to do that very effectively. So what we have is 15 states that have adopted some kind of gerrymander reform and they vary greatly. Uh, some of them are really good systems uh, where you have a, a, an independent commission made up of four Republicans and four Democrats, or in some cases, four Republicans, four Democrats, and four independents. And maybe there's a 13th member, um, as in uh, Michigan, that's going to be this year, uh, an independent. So the independents have five, and each party has four. And for a districting plan to be approved, it has to be approved by eight out of the 13 members to try to make sure that it is bipartisan, that it is fair. In other states, they have, quote, gerrymander reform with an independent uh, commission, but the commission is named by the governor or the majority leader or the minority leaders of the state Senate. And what you do is you have the parties bargaining and they'll say, we'll give you those seats safe and we want these seats safe. And that's really kind of phony gerrymander reform. Uh, Virginia may be on the verge of a, uh, applying a gerrymander reform of that kind of nature. Uh, it just passed gerrymander reform. Uh, the most important thing is that you try to get the politicians out of the process of drawing the lines. And the second most important thing is that whatever law they're operating under or whatever state constitutional provision they're operating under says very clearly and concisely that no districts can be drawn that favor one party over any other party and none can be drawn to protect incumbents. And if states have that, then the kind of mechanism they have uh, matters less than that standard. Florida has left 
the redistricting up to the legislature, but if the legislature doesn't do it right, they can get sued. And in fact, they did get sued. It got taken to court and the su state Supreme Court threw out the legislative plan and redrew uh, the maps themselves. It took a long time, but it happened. So you've got gerrymander reform a in, in a slew of places. Um, six new states this year, Ohio, Michigan, Colorado, Utah, and because of court action, not because of legislative action, to some degree, uh, uh, North Carolina, and then also, as I mentioned before, Virginia. So the key is what I just said, and that's major. It's really important. And I think that the advantage that uh, I mentioned to you before, to the Republican Party of 20 seats because of their uh, dominance, they don't do it all. I mean, Democrats gerrymander like hell in Maryland and in Illinois and in Massachusetts. They do it. They're just as bad at it or good at it as the Republicans. But the Republicans control more state governments. The trifectas, they have more state governments. So that's number one. That's a, that is a reform movement that is moving. Uh, there's experience behind it. There are results that show it makes a difference. Second major reform has gotten almost no attention whatsoever. It is hardly known and that is nonpartisan primaries. Uh, California adopted them a few years ago. Washington state has had uh, a nonpartisan primaries uh, for well over a decade. And Alaska uh, this fall just voted in nonpartisan primaries. Um, and the whole point there is to do two or three things, to diminish the power and influence of the party extremists to enfranchise all those independent voters who had to join a party in order to vote, and many of them didn't want to do that. So you can, you can uh, include them. Uh, the theory at least is that that should increase turnout, which is a good thing. And by making them nonpartisan, you put the pressure on politicians to move towards the center. This is the theory, move towards the center because in order to win, they got to appeal across party lines. So the thought is bigger turnout, less clout for extremists, more pushing the uh, candidates to the center. Well, the interesting thing is that Washington state is a great laboratory. Uh, it's now had operating nonpartisan primaries since 2008. And there are three really amazing things to tell you about Washington state. Washington state now has a 10 member delegation, six Democrats and four Republicans. Uh, it used to have five Democrats and four Republicans. Population changed a decade ago, and so they picked up another seat. The party lineup has not changed, but the kind of people who win has changed significantly. And that's what's interesting about these reforms. First of all, what happened was, in fact, turnout has gone up in every congressional off-year election in every one of the 10 districts, okay? So there are in fact more people drawn into voting. Uh, probably most of them independents, but the point is more people see more choice, see more action going on, and they wanna get involved. So the idea that turnout goes up has actually happened. The second thing is, in fact, there are people who have won under this nonpartisan primary system. They call it in some states the top to primary system. What they mean by that is that in the primary, everybody runs together. Republicans, Democrats, independents, Greens, Libertarians, Patriot parties, you name it, whatever you wanna call it. And the top two winners, and they can even be from the same party, go on and compete in the general election so that you have a majority winner in the end. What's happened in Washington now for at least three or four elections is that in a very conservative district in Eastern Washington, one that used to be dominated by a very right-wing Republican who was Tea Party before the Tea Party was invented, has been represented now by a mainstream Republican named Dan Newhouse, a Republican who was sufficiently bipartisan that he actually served as the agriculture commissioner in the administration of the Democratic governor, Christine Gregoire. He has been reelected now four times. In the primary, he almost always runs second, but he qualifies for the general because uh, it's a very conservative Republican party out there. And in, the, and in the general election, when it's down to two candidates in the independents and the other minor party, 
uh, candidates fall out. He wins because he appeals across party lines and the usually hard right conservative who ran first in the primary winds up by losing. And conversely, in the city of Seattle, which is a liberal uh, democratic base, in the first congressional district, the winner has been over the last four elections, a woman named Susan Del Benny, who is a conservative, a business conservative Democrat, not a hard conservative. She's a former Microsoft executive. And when she tried to get nominated in party conventions uh, in Washington state uh, before they had the, uh, the nonpartisan primary, she regularly came in third and she's done very well. She comes in sometimes second in the primary, but she always wins the general election. And now that she's an incumbent, she tends to win the primaries. So the second thing that they said would happen has happened. There are candidates who run closer to the center who actually win under the system, whereas if you'd had a party primary, they never would have qualified for the general. They would have fallen because they ran second in the primary. Now, the really interesting development is what happens when those people get in office. And there's an outfit called govtrack.us and it tracks the voting records of members of the House of Representatives and state legislatures and, and whatnot. And they put them on a chart and they run a chart of Congress that looks like a football field with red zones, the 20 yard lines into the end zone. And in, in, I don't know what happened in the last year, the figures are not for the last year, but two years for this last Congress. But two years ago, there was not a single member of the Washington delegation, not one of the six Democrats, not one of the four Republicans, whose voting record put them in the outer 20% of their party. None of them were in the red zones. All of them were paying between the 20 yard lines, somewhere closer to the center of the field. And a couple of them were about as close as I've seen anybody to that old diagram that I mentioned to you before of the political parties back 30, 40 years ago. So that's the third thing. My belief is that if we had 10 states, 10 states like Georgia, Massachusetts, Missouri, states with you know seven, eight, nine members of Congress, if we had 10 states operating like Washington state, we would break gridlock. We'd actually, have, we'd actually have a Congress where you had members that would focus on solving problems, not scoring points and, and focusing on the next election because they have constituencies that expect results as opposed to having party machines behind them, making sure their district is gerrymandered and they're well-funded and they can get in office. By the way, the funding is a very important part of the party system. A lot of us, myself included, wonder again and again and again, how the hell does Mitch McConnell do it? How does he keep all those Republicans in line? How do you go all the way from Ted Cruz to Susan Collins? And, um, and why is it that Lisa Murkowski is able to break away almost more than anybody else? Money's a big reason. Uh, in the Senate races this past year, McConnell's Senate leadership pack contributed $223 million to Senate campaigns. The money was being rooted through McConnell. It's one of the ways he gets power. By the way, his biggest single donor was Sheldon Adelson, the Las Vegas billionaire who died uh, just a few days ago. So maybe Mitchell have, have some problems. And Sheldon Adelson, his wife, I think in the last election cycle gave more than $50 million uh, out of that 223 that, that Mitch gave away. All right, so I've given you two suggestions, gerrymander reform, nonpartisan primaries. Now what's interesting is along with nonpartisan primaries, people are developing the idea of rank choice voting and pairing that. In the Alaska reform that just got passed, they combined nonpartisan primary with rank choice voting. And they have so many parties up there that they actually made it not a top two primary, but a top four primary the top four voters, the, the top four candidates for every office in future elections up there will qualify for the general election. You say, Jesus, what's that all about? And it's just a mess, right? Well, that's where ranked choice voting comes in. What comes in is you don't just vote. 
you say, this is my first choice, my second choice, my third choice, my fourth choice. And when you get the general election ballots in, you count them. And the candidate, if, if somebody gets 50% or more, the idea is that you got to get a majority, 50% plus one. If nobody has a majority, then the bottom candidate with the lowest number of ballots is dropped out. And those ballots are reallocated to the second choice of those voters. And if it doesn't work, then the third candidate, uh, it gets knocked out until somebody gets more than 50% of the vote. This actually has made a difference. Uh, Maine has been using ranked choice voting now for several years, uh, in several uh, rounds of elections. And I, back in um, 2018, there was a Democrat named Jared Golden uh, running in the Northern, Maine has two congressional districts. Um, and he ran, it was a four person race and Golden ran second. He ran behind a Republican uh, by about 2000 votes. And then when they reallocated through the ranked choice voting system, in the end, Golden won the seat uh, by 3000 votes. And the point being here twofold, um, one is that at least you have a, an elected official who has a majority behind them. And the second thing is, once again, like the nonpartisan primary itself, it puts pressure on politicians to move towards the middle, or at least to appeal to a much broader range uh, of, of uh, voters than they would uh, if they were just running in a party primary without ranked choice voting. Um, one of the things that's really important is the link up between mega donors and party primaries and breaking that link. I actually saw that link at work at one point uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, it can be used with party primaries. Large donors can be used to enforce party discipline uh, and cause the parties to gel more as blocks. Uh, in New Hampshire, uh, right after Obamacare was passed, New Hampshire was one of those states that was divided in the legislature, a Democratic governor, and I think the houses of the legislature were controlled one by one party, one by the other party, maybe by the opposite party of the governor. In any case, there was not going to be a partisan decision. So the governor appointed a bipartisan commission to come up with a plan for how New Hampshire would handle Medicaid. And the commission was made up of Republicans and Democrats from the legislature, of course. And I think the governor had a representative too. And, and it was pretty split uh, between the two parties, pretty evenly split. And they came back with a recommendation that New Hampshire adopt Medicaid and they've had a plan for how to do it. That day, Americans for Prosperity and the Republican Party leadership in New Hampshire threatened to primary two of the Republicans who were on the commission who had voted for the joint plan. And within 24 hours, they had changed their position. They withdrawn their support. So what I, but to me, that was an object lesson in the power of mega money tied together with a party primary. So we do need to get into money and money is a factor here, but I believe it becomes much more powerful when you have it um, connected to the party apparatus and the party primary. Now I mentioned before Lisa Murkowski, and she, I think she's a living example of how anything that promotes independence of candidates in their home states helps in Washington. Lisa Murkowski lost the primary, uh, not the last election, but two elections ago. I forget what that is. It's probably back in, uh, probably back in 2010, 2012. She lost the Republican primary. She decided to run as an independent against the party and she got elected. Now she's a Republican. She caucuses with the Republicans, but she is easily and regularly the most independent minded of the Senate Republican. And I would contend the reason is she got elected outside the party system. She is not dependent in any way on the party primary or on party money to have her seat. 
Uh, she did it perhaps because her father was a senator and she's got a well-known name and so on and so forth. But the point is that mechanism has worked and you see the result um, here. So my thought is that the more we can um, include gerrymander reform, nonpartisan primaries, and by the way, she was able to do that because Alaska does not have one of the last sins of the party system, which is the sore loser law. The sore loser law in most states, and you got it in Texas and Florida and Michigan and Wisconsin and Ohio and a whole lot of other places. The sore loser law says, if you ran in a party primary, you are barred by law from running in the general election. Now, just think what that means. I mean, Joe Lieberman in Connecticut never could have run. He had to quit the Democratic Party, and then he could run, actually, because Connecticut didn't have a sore loser law, and he ran as, a, as an independent and got reelected. Now, you may or may not like Joe Lieberman. My point here is about Lieberman and Lisa Murkowski. They demonstrate the need to get rid of sore loser laws so that candidates can run, and lo and behold, they're popular enough to win, even running against their own party. I think we need to break up the parties. Let's call up, let's say the party's over <laughs> and, uh, and then move for reform. I'm gonna stop there and see if I've provoked people rather than putting them to sleep and, uh, and, and listen to what you all wanna say yourselves or whatever questions or, or rotten tomatoes you wanna throw at me. May I be the first? Can I be heard? I can sure hear you. Okay, thanks for a, a, a most thought-provoking presentation. Uh, I wonder if I might um, challenge one of your assumptions, just one at a time. And that is, what's so good about being middle of the road? Being moderate, as we call it. Suppose you have one really corrupt, nasty party, and then you have a not quite so corrupt, but pretty bad party. If you go for the middle of the road, you're gonna be mis mixing bad and not quite so bad. Wouldn't it be better to have not quite so bad and something that stands completely outside of whatever the mainstream happens to be? What's so good about the mainstream? Well, I'm glad you took me on in this point because the real point here is independent mindedness. Uh, and independent minded, well, in the first place, when you have extremism, you've got what we've had for the last 15 years, okay? You've got a country that can't solve uh, budgets. We, we can't pass budgets anymore. We can't solve uh, immigration reform. We, we haven't done very effectively on COVID. Now you can say that's uh, in, in the administration, but one issue after another, we have been gridlocked on and we just kick it down the road. When you have, when you have um, parties that are ideologically consistent and extreme, you can't solve the nation's problems. So um, uh, the business about moderation is, is much more that you're not locked into extremism and you can actually look at problem solving. Parties, the parties, the way they're organized today, you know, the, Trump and the Republicans are a hell of a lot happier with a lot of terribly discontented voters that will be loyal to them. You go start solving those problems and they're not as happy and they, and they become happy. They're not as loyal to you as they, and the same thing on the democratic side. You, what, you, what you're doing is you're playing the rhetorical game rather than the problem solving game. And what you're looking for, and that's why I was trying to say with, with Lisa Murkowski, what you're looking for is some kind of independent mindedness we can actually deal with people in the other party. I, I don't think, I don't think it's, a, you're not talking about two bowls of liquid here that you mix. I don't think that's what politics are. You're talking about people who can either work together or not. Is there a system that motivates them to work together or at least allows them to work together? Or is it a system that motivates them to work against each other again and again and again? So what you're saying is that middle of the road is really beside the point. What you're looking for is independent mindedness. And that is usually what you find outside of the mainstream. Uh, not necessarily, not necessarily. I, I, I'm looking for people who are willing to be pragmatic and, and want to solve problems as opposed to beat the other side over the head with an ideological club. 
Uh, Rick, I have a question, and that relates to gerrymandering. The Senate, as you know, the U.S. Senate is not gerrymandered at all. Uh, everyone runs statewide. Uh, and you pointed, uh, Georgia was an example. I think you applauded uh, the turnout uh, it's, it's for the Senate races. Have you been able to detect, or has anybody been able to ascertain whether, as a legislative body, the U.S. Senate operates under different principles, different moderation than the House uh, that shows that there is a correlation between gerrymandering and legislative functioning? No, I don't think you can, but I think what you, what you find, Bruce, is that the, uh, the politics of the House, and, the, and more importantly, the politics of the parties. And, and once again here, the disciplining that's going on in the U.S. Senate is the same as the disciplining that's going on in the House, and that is it's going on through the party primary. Okay, when you get to the general election, the contest is <laughs> the gerrymander that was the Connecticut Compromise when the Constitution was written, large states and small states. But the discipline, let me give you an example. Ted Cruz, when he won his Senate nomination in Texas in 2012, beat uh, a field of several, including the lieutenant governor, a guy named Dewhurst, who was really quite a popular lieutenant governor. Uh, the turnout was low in the primary. And with the sore loser law in Texas, Dewhurst couldn't run. So the Texas voters never got the choice of Cruz, Dewhurst, or a Connecticut the discipline in, uh, and that affected the way the Senate operates was applied in the party primary in Texas. But it seems to me, Rick, your example shows that there are other manipulative uh, operative facts in the party system that caused the, the Senate to uh, have uh, uh, not really competitive races that are separate from gerrymandering, because there is no gerrymandering in Senate seats. There may be not openness and fairness, because you've described ways. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, I, I would not say, obviously, in the Senate, gerrymandering isn't the, isn't the, the, uh, the party lever that works. It is the party primary. It's the, the, it's, it's the party primary and, and the fact that regularly, particularly in states south of the Great Lakes, the turnout in party primaries is very low. I mean, that's, it's, that's where money and the party primary and the party leadership become very important. But it, it seems to me, this is another question that I had, and I apologize for probably overstaying my welcome, but the, you know, the Supreme Court has held repeatedly that political parties are private actors and they, the state can't interfere with how they wish to decide who becomes the nominee of their party. So you can't prevent a political party if it wishes to decide to run you know, a, a party primary, a partisan one rather than- Oh yeah, but the most of them are supported by taxes. Most of them are publicly funded. If the party wants to run a primary, let the party go finance its own primary. Let it operate like a private club. That's the problem. Our political system is mixed. The court says they're a private entity, but in most states, they, they then dominate the legislature, which then passes laws that fund the party primaries, and they become part of the, the governmental apparatus. So in the states uh, that you found that have these nonpartisan primaries, have those laws been supported equally by Republicans and Democrats? Um, it depends upon who was the dominant party before the reform. In other words, if you were, if you were, if if I, if you go to Maryland, which mm -hmm. is a democratic uh, uh, gerrymandered state, the leading advocate of gerrymandered reform is Larry Hogan, the Republican governor. Why? Because the Democrats are running the system. So uh, the answer is there are more Republicans, uh, more Republican trifectas than there are Democratic trifectas. The Democrats are running the process. I mean, the Republicans, excuse me, are running the process in more states. So there are more Democrats who are opposed to gerrymandering than Republicans. But uh, all you got to do is take a look, uh, take a look in Illinois. 
I mean, there's a lot of pressure among the North Shore Republican voters, North Shore, north of Chicago, that want gerrymander reform. Why? Because uh, the House Speaker is running the gerrymandering uh, in Illinois, and they want fair elections. So the answer is, it depends upon what the situation is. If you're the out party, you want reform. If you're the in party, you don't want it. Thanks. Could I ask the next question? Sure. Um, uh, Rick, I just want to say I think that's a terrific presentation. Um, I've gone uh, to uh, 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 conferences a couple times organized by Fair Vote, the national organization that's the big promoter of ranked choice voting. Right. And I think it's just uh, a terrific reform. And all of these reforms are not just good for independents, but they're also if you're a, a loyal Democrat or a, a loyal Republican, your party will get better candidates. And I think that's a, a really important uh, thing. I'd like to um, uh, ask you, the, the, uh, uh, more than a century ago, the, uh, the United States adopted the Australian ballot, the secret ballot, which was at, a time, at that time a reform in the United States. And the Australians have been ahead of us on a lot of things. They have ranked choice voting too. I toured the um, Australian Electoral Commission in Canberra a couple of years ago, and they just have a terrific presentation. They have something else, and it is nonpartisan administration of elections. And without touching on any events of, of recent uh, vintage, um, in Australia, they have bitter politics. They hate each other there, just like we do here. However, nobody questions the honesty of the elections. And they have the Ele Australian Electoral Commission. They're the world standard. Uh, uh, emerging democracies hire them to help them to show how to run uh, 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 nonpartisan elections. What do you think of the idea of nonpartisan administration of elections? We are just about the only advanced country in the world that allows politicians to run elections. It's not just Australia, all through Europe. Switzerland, Austria, Germany, the Scandinavian countries, they all have nonpartisans. They, they, they have, you know, bureaucrats, right? They have nonpartisan uh, officials running their elections, counting their votes. And they have this, they, I mean, this idea, are there ever contested elections? Are there ever any complaints? Sure, uh, but nothing like what we experience. And I don't mean just this year, but, but even in other years. Yeah I, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any question it would be smarter to have uh, elections run by nonpartisan uh, career officials. I mean, I mean, Australia is a great example, but I, uh, I don't know that it is absolutely universal in Europe, but I know it is the dominant system in Europe. Uh, most European countries have it. You know, I, I don't know what it is in Africa, Latin America, but that wouldn't necessarily be where I'd go look for models. Yeah, maybe we could hire the Australians to come and give us lessons, just like- but They the also, I think in Australia, don't they also have financial penalties, fines if you don't vote, and then if yes. you don't vote in one election, uh, then you, yeah. the fine gets doubled if you don't vote in the next election, and it gets quadrupled if you don't vote in the next election. I mean, there are a bunch yeah. of states that do things like that. And I think- yeah, Mandatory voting, we wouldn't necessarily need to adopt that, but, um, but um, they, uh, they uh, you know, very, very nonpartisan administration. and. And again, they, they have bitter politics. They hate each other, uh, but nobody questions the result. So I'm gonna hop in. This is a segue for, for the next, the question that I was thinking about when you were speaking. When, another aspect of our problems here in the United States is that we have voter suppression. I've been a, worked in a campaign since uh, McGovern, uh, and I've seen a growing uh, problem with uh, voter suppression issues. For example, I worked for the Obama campaign in Manassas, Virginia uh, in 2012. And the, the polling place that um, in that area, the, the white areas had many booths for people to vote. And the areas with uh, Latino and black residents, there were two voting booth machines for thousands of people. And they would go in the morning to vote lines were blocks long, lunch blocks long, and then at the end of the day, they went back. Some voters went back and waited hours to vote, uh, and that was a decision by the state legislature in Virginia to restrict 
access to voting in that community. Well, you've got, yeah, there's no question that's a problem. I mean, I, I could have gone in that direction, but I was trying to address the parties. I mean, uh, f the photo ID laws that have been passed by, initially passed by 16 states and they've been thrown out essentially by courts in five states. But there, there's no question that some of those are designed uh, to raise obstacles and, and to suppress the vote. If you take North Dakota, there's a state law that has photo ID and you have to have a photo ID uh, and people who live on native reservations and there are six native reservations in North Dakota. Uh, they have tribal ID, and that is an acceptable ID, okay? But state law says that your state ID to qualify for voting must have a street address. And tribal ID uses RFD or post boxes. And so they've disqualified thousands of voters uh, in North Dakota. In Texas, they have a photo ID law, which eventually uh, got modified somewhat. Modified. But the photo ID that was permitted included your driver's license, of course, and military ID if you had it, or US government or state government ID if you had it, your hunting license or your gun license, but not your student ID if you went to a state public university. Right? They're not necessarily directed at, uh, at racial and ethnic minorities, but certainly directed at young voters. So, I mean, and the same thing was true, by the way, in North Carolina and in Alabama. So, yeah, there's no question that we're getting um, a kind of reintroduction. In fact, there was a whole argument down in Florida whether or not the Florida photo ID law was, uh, and, and this whole thing about the, the, the registering and re-registering of convicted felons who had served their time but hadn't paid off all their fines, whether or not we were getting a reintroduction of a poll tax, which as you know, was constitutionally banned by the, what is it, the 24th Amendment, I think. So yeah, I mean, that's a major problem. I was trying to deal with a structural problem here. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering if you're open to more radical reforms. I, I believe the constitution doesn't require congressional districts. If you want to bust the parties, at least in the house, you could, uh, have no congressional districts within each state and then, you know, have some sort of a proportional representation um, uh, system set up among the states. Maybe I'm wrong. I think it does require congressional districts. I don't think so. No, you could have, have a multi, a state could be a multi-member district and everyone. One state could be itself a multi-member district. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. If, now, some states in the past, they've, 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 they've uh, oftentimes been thrown out because they were used to dilute uh, racial minority strength under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. But states, you know, as recently as, you know, 20, 30 years ago, they had multi-member districts. They weren't statewide, uh, but they had three or four uh, members uh, all elected from a single district. So it is an option, but I say because of Section Two of the Voting Rights, the uh, the the history of diluting minority votes, the larger the district, they've largely been abandoned. I, even, I wasn't even aware that. Where was that going on, Bruce? Uh, I know Indiana. There's a famous case called Whitcomb versus Chavis. It's a multi-member uh, district. Hmm. Indiana. Edward. Uh, I'm wondering uh, to what extent ignorance is a factor. I wonder how many of the rioters uh, at the Capitol could pass the citizenship test for new citizens. And I'm, I'm wondering if the U.S. educational system, which is uh, controlled by the states individually, fosters this kind of ignorance, which allows this kind of activity to occur. What would you say? Well, I don't think there's any question that there are a lot of people who don't know enough. It doesn't mean they're stupid, but they are ignorant in the sense of being not knowing. Um, but um, I had kind of hoped we were going to avoid getting into this, but I'll get into it. I mean, I, I don't think there's any question that there are large bodies of Americans who are not subject to rational proof and evidence. Um, I, you know, I mean, I had a discussion with a friend last night at dinner and he said, we need a bipartisan commission 
to investigate the election and go out and tell people that the election actually was accurate and fair. And I said, you know, that's been done in each of the states. And there are a whole lot of things in the courts. I, you know, I, I hope we can get below 39% of the people of the country distrusting the results of the election, get it down at 25 or something like that. But I think there's a 25% or something hardcore that doesn't want to know facts. I mean, I, I don't know whether or not that's a failure of the educational system, or if you believe in the apocalypse or you believe in some other things that people believe in, like the QAnon theory, um, there's not a hell of a lot of education that's going to get you out of that particularly as an adult. But um, my, my appeal on that one is uh, in every school, everywhere, there's a civic minute devoted to civic education in every grade, every day, a minute for whatever grade you're at. It's one minute in first grade and it's 12 minutes in 12th grade. And you have to have it every single day. Yeah, and it, Rick, I was gonna say, it's not just the voters. Uh, we have members of Congress on both the right and the left, not know have three branches of government. Talk of you know various chambers. We have a president of the United States who thinks there's 12 articles of the Constitution, and says under Article Two I can do anything I want as president. Yeah. So, yeah, well, I was I was trying to address that willful <laughs> that willful it's a willful ignorance. There's there is ignorance out there, but there's also willful ignorance out there. Rick, can I connect Pat. for one second? Um, yeah, Pat. Um, thank you for all you do. I, I, you're, I loved your book a number of years ago. I, I agree with you. I think both parties were captured by the money interest over the last 30 years, and it's not representing the interest of, of the people. And that's part of the political turmoil. And I agree with the ideas you have for grassroots reform. In fact, we did that in Virginia. We did help get that commission set up and bipartisan. Um, but I want to come back. You mentioned Mitch McConnell and how he controls those Republican senators or how he had the money and how he raised that money from a very specific person. I just think money in our political system is just completely out of control. And I don't, I think we have to come back and go back after how to somehow to do something about that. I know the Supreme Court, I think in Buckley v. Vallejo said, you know, money's speech, but there's got to be some way we, that we insist that the federal government fund these elections or do something to get the money and the, and the control that follows from that money um, where the, the, the politicians don't address the real needs of the people. Okay. I don't disagree with you, uh, Pat. Uh, I, have, uh, I have a certain frustration uh, with the whole idea of getting money out of politics. I don't think we're ever going to get money out of politics. Um, and as I travel the country, now I'm a bit off uh, working on the issue of what to do about political parties, but one of the reforms that impressed me the most, I could not believe it when I saw it, was the public funding of campaigns in Connecticut. Now remember, we had public funding of presidential elections, uh, you know, from Jimmy Carter all the way to, uh, through Bill Clinton. We had it for 20 years, Republicans and Democrats alike. Uh, and it did uh, curb the influence of money. Well, in Connecticut, what they've done is they've adopted a public funding system. It is actually a subsidy. Now, there are multiple kinds of public funding systems. In New York and Los Angeles, uh, and in the HR1 that the Democrats are pushing, uh, it's, a, it's a match for all small donors up to 150 or 175 or $200. Uh, the government will put in four times as much or six times as much. So the small donor becomes important to the political candidate. In Connecticut, it's an outright subsidy. It's, um, as I recall, um, it's $25,000, $35,000 for a House seat and it's $90,000 for a Senate seat and it's $3 million and now $6 million if you're running for governor and so forth. What is utterly amazing in Connecticut, and they've been doing this now since 2008, is that 80% of the legislative candidates in the state of Connecticut accept public funding rather than raise private funding. Now they have to raise a certain amount of small donor uh, uh, contributions under $100. Uh, the number of voters is different depending upon the size of their district. But I think the House members have to have to raise 300 and the Senate have to raise 500 and the governor have to raise 5,000, something like that. So they have to raise some private money, small donors, to demonstrate that they're a viable candidate. 
But once they're viable and they get accepted for a subsidy, not another penny uh, of, of private money comes in. Uh, they've adopted it. Both parties use it. The candidates from both parties, in fact, the Workers Family Party, other parties, they use it. It's reduced the influence of lobbyists and the legislature in terms of the influence of money. Lobbyists are still there, but the lobbyists are arguing. They're trying to present evidence. They're trying to make good arguments instead of saying, I can fund your campaign, which is yeah. an important difference, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, so the hospitals and the Girl Scouts are out there arguing just as hard as the gun lobby and the, uh, you know, and the contractors and everybody else. It's an amazing system, and, and it's been working now for quite a while. Maine has public funding. Minnesota has public funding. 21 states have some form of public funding. Most of them, about 14 of them, have public funding for uh, judicial races because they don't want money going into picking judges. Uh, Larry Hogan, the Repo uh, there are half a dozen states that have public funding only for governor, lieutenant governor, and statewide offices. Larry Hogan, the currently sitting Republican governor of Maryland, won with a publicly funded campaign against the Democratic machine, and he actually used the argument that you expect Democrats to use against Republicans. He used it against the Democrats saying, you got the machine money, I've got the public taxpayers' money, and I'm going to serve the taxpayers, and you're going to serve the machine, and he, by God, won. Yes. So, I mean, everybody assumes it's going to be the Democrats on one side and the Republicans on the other, and that's why I answered Bruce the way I did before. It all depends upon who's sitting there with the power and the big cash. And if you're sitting there with the power and the big cash, you don't want reform. And if you're sitting there without power and the big cash, you want reform. It's not, it's not partisan. The only reason we perceive it as a partisan is we're sitting in Washington and we perceive everything simplistically partisan. Uh, so, Greg, see, I, we, I, we, we have some uh, uh, people, uh, Tom uh, Mansback and Frank Loy, uh, people who have been very involved in, um, in fundraising. Uh, do you, do you, you want to ask Rick a question? Yeah, I, have a, I, I actually want to make a, a comment. Rick mentioned uh, 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 teaching civics in school, and I just wanted to direct people uh, to uh, something called Virginia Civics, vacivics.org, uh, which is funding, uh, actually, they're, they're teaching civics to uh, 6,500 kids in Virginia. Uh, and if anyone's interested in looking at civics in school, uh, I can direct you to the people who are running this thing. It's also uh, uh, cooperating with the National Constitutional Center, Philadelphia. Uh, it's a very big and very important thing since the public schools have decided not to teach civics anymore. Uh, this is outside of the schools making civics courses available to our students so that they know the importance of what we're trying to do, just what we're talking about today. That's great. About the legislature in Massachusetts about three years ago mandated a civics course for all eighth graders in Massachusetts schools. Uh, and that program has been ginned up. They has, there's some independent people who are working on that and they got in touch with me and wanted me to uh, contribute. I, I don't really know much about it, but that is the only state that I know, but well, I may be ignorant and wrong, uh, but that, at least I know that Massachusetts has a program that is now incorporated into public schools. Yeah, well, this uh, is maybe. inside of the public schools. This is done as an extracurricular activity and these kids sign up for it in droves. It has to be supported. Tom, uh, uh, Bruce Fine and I are very interested in talking to you more about that. We're trying to um, teach a, a course in civics in Rappahannock County. And um, let's, no, let's I mean, talk no, about yeah. that. Absolutely. Great. Great. Uh, Frank, Frank, you're a, you, you've watched money in politics. Where, where do you come out? Looks like he's muted, Frank. Am I unmuted? There you are. Yeah, you're unmuted. Yeah. There, well, there you are. First of all, I want to say that Hedrick's presentation is both rational and wildly important and very balanced. I mean, I want to clone Hedrick because 
what he's talking about is at the very root of our society. I don't have any better ideas than what he has presented. I think um, th three areas that uh, we've all talked about, that is making it, doing something about Vallejo versus uh, the Vallejo case, which equates money with speech is kind of, it's kind of silly. And I'd like to figure out a way around that. And, and Hedrick suggested one way. The second thing is that it seems to me that you've got to address the role of the primary, the role of the, uh, of the state legislature in setting electoral districts for districts uh, that vote for Congress. I mean, it, it is a disgrace the way those are the the ways are are drawn, and and if you don't do that, you're going to have the same problem that Hedrick talks about. I I don't have much to add to that except to say that of all the programs I've heard of from the from this organization that I think we can do something about and we need to do something about, this is right at number one. Thank you. See, if I could add Rick to the, the finance issue, it complicates it is because you've described uh, money that candidate to on his campaign, uh, matching at least uh, offsetting effect of wealth. But the Citizens United, coupled with Buckley and Baleo, hold that even if, if you're a corporation, a rich person, and you have so independent expenditures, you don't necessarily collude with a candidate but you oftentimes use his aide who's been with him 50 years, you could spend billions of dollars uh, in expenditures uh, supporting a campaign. Uh, and the First Amendment, according to Citizens United, protects that limitless spending. Uh, so it's the money that's outside the immediate control that's causing the stay or influence of the special interest because the money is out of sight the money that the candidates themselves spend. I mean, it's hard to imagine the current court reversing Vallejo, but the notion that money is equated to speech, and if you can't restrict speech, you can't restrict money, that seems to me to be undemocratic. Yeah, you have a constitutional amendment if you want to change the rule, though, because you're no way that this constituted is going to reverse Citizens United or Buckley and that score. Um, yeah. Let me just let me just say one of the reasons why I was interested in talking tonight about parties and not about money. Because when I got into looking at problems in the political system about a decade ago, which is just about the time that the Citizens United decision was issued in January of 2010. I thought money was the most important issue and the one that could be dealt with. And um, I just, I, I don't disagree with any of the points that have been made, either your points or Frank Lloyd's points or other points that have been made, Pat Malloy's point. I agree with all of them. It's just an extremely slippery issue. It is, it is almost impossible to imagine, certainly court decisions reversing uh, Buckley versus Vallejo or Citizens United or, you know, the other ones subsequent to that. Uh, it's very difficult to imagine that even with the citizen movements where 20 states have now called one way or another for a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United uh, and to address some of the issues you brought up, money as speech and corporations uh, as equivalent to people. Um, I still can't see Congress moving. Um, I really believe that in practical terms, the most effective way of dealing with big money is actually the public funding approach. But I really think we've got a better shot at, at reforming our political system in significant ways by tackling the problem of the party duopoly than we do uh, the money. Now, I'm talking about that as a practical problem. It can be attacked state by state. It doesn't take federal action. It doesn't take three quarters of the states to pass an amendment to change 
the, the thrust of court opinions. Um, those are very, very tough uh, hurdles to overcome. And um, it, we've got 15 states that have done something about it. We've got 35 that haven't. Uh, so we've still got a long ways to go, but in our nonpartisan primaries, we've only got three states that have adopted them. But if you, got, if you could get to seven or eight or 10 states that adopt nonpartisan primaries, I believe the political dynamics in this country would change. I don't know, Bruce, in terms of your very good question about the Senate, how it plays out, but I do know that there is um, a leakage, there is a, there is a symbiotic effect. If the House becomes extremely partisan, uh, it has an effect on Senate politics, particularly when it can be reinforced by uh, the money that's concentrated and also by the party primaries. Never underestimate the importance of party primaries as a disciplinary tool, because when you combine money with a party primary, you can go in and discipline all kinds of people. Anybody who say, yeah, it's a statewide election if they can get to the general. And it is a statewide primary, but the turnout is very low. And the turnout tends to be the people who are more extreme than the people who are, are more pragmatic. I should have called not centrist when I got called on rebuilding the middle. Let's rebuild the pragmatists as opposed to the ideologues. Think of it that way. If we had a system uh, that produced a, a political system that produced candidates who were pragmatic with different philosophies and different attitudes, you would go back to, to a time when you know, Dwight Eisenhower and, and Lyndon Johnson and Sam Rayburn sat down together. Um, you, know, you would go back, Richard Nixon was dealing with Democrats and Congress. You go back to a time when um, people with very different viewpoints were able to literally not only pass a budget every year. What is a, what is a budget? A budget is a set of national priorities. We have not been able to pass a budget for 15 years, we pass a continuing resolution every year. Why? Because the only thing we can agree to do is we can't afford to shut down, so we'll continue doing what we've been doing, but let's put more money in the military, okay? John, to be right to, to your point. If you want to get to the, I mean, when I came to Washington in 1960, the Congress every frigging year passed 13 appropriations bills. The federal budget was busted up into 13 different parts. These people who came from different parties were able to deal with each other and pass 13 different appropriations bills. Today, we can't pass one magna. All we can do is pass a continuing resolution, which is loaded in the middle of the night with all kinds of goodies for people who, who've put up all kinds of money in campaigns. I mean, it stinks, guys. It stinks. But Rick, let me ask you. So Rick, are you saying, or, go ahead. That, that John, I, I, this is very intriguing to me. Rick, in the states that you find that there have been the kind of reforms you've described, do you find a uh, greater ability for third and four, fourth parties to emerge, challenge the duopoly, or is it just a less uh, stagnant duopoly, but it's still a duopoly? Um, I don't think you're going to get to that till you get to the uh, nonpartisan primary. I think fixing gerrymander reform uh, goes part way. I think all that does is it frees people up to run as pragmatists as opposed to running as ideologues. But if you want to get to the point where you're going to give a, a third and fourth party a chance, then you've got to go to nonpartisan primaries. You've got, you've got to open the system up. So the new young entrepreneur, if you will, to go back to the politics industry uh, uh, metaphor, if you want new political entrepreneurs, if you want third and fourth parties, if you want people with very different ideas, then you've got to make it possible for them to run in something. At the moment, they can't run in anything except the general. And by that time, the thing is all locked up. So the, the, the nonpartisan primary is a, is a brand new piece, and it's a very important piece, and it needs to be supported, too. So the answer to your question, Bruce. So Rick, let me. The gerrymandering fix doesn't take care of, of that problem. You've got to go the next step. So so let me see if I can uh, take what you said and 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 ask it this way. Are are you saying that if you if you did the the the, the your first three points, the, you go after gerrymandering, 
uh, nonpartisan primaries and rank order voting. If you had those three, have those, and also then the money would it would be much more, more difficult. And what? And also get rid of the sore loser law. And the sore loser law. If you did those four things, it would be much more difficult for the politicians to be bought, right? It would be more is difficult. That, is that for your them point? That bought? it would it would break up the the monolithic quality of the of uh, of the parties. It would it would reduce the power of the leadership over the membership. I mean, members would right. be able to operate more on their own. It would also, I think, it would also tie members of Congress closer to their districts. Because they, if you have to run in a truly competitive situation, you can't afford to get too far away from your district. If you have a gerrymandered district, you care much more about the party boss who can raise money for you for the one race you've got to win, which is the party okay. primary. That's why Mitch McConnell is so much more, yeah. more important. If, if, and, and then in the House, it's even, it's even more so. I mean, you're, you're, if, if we right. believe in multiplicity of ideas, if we believe in entrepreneurship in our economy, then you want to believe in entrepreneurship in our politics. Then you've got to provide a playing field where an entrepreneur, a genuinely different political character of a different party or a different ideology or just a different notion of what should be a priority, Great can actually run, can actually compete. In the present system, they can't compete. It is a duopoly and they set it up so, so no new competitors can come in and take customers away from them. It's a great analogy, the duopoly. I may ask a question uh, when there's a break. Go ahead. Fire. So uh, if I may just share my own experience, I'm, I'm from Minnesota. And uh, through the 1980s and the 1990s, I've admitted this publicly, I was a bit of a Republican. 9-11 hit uh, as a lawyer, as part of a debating society of uh, conservatives and libertarians. And I saw a transmu transmutation take place in front of my very eyes of a radical turn into radical right-wing politics, I'll call it, where all of a sudden torture was acceptable to these people, including the libertarians. And so ever since then, I've seen uh, how much we've changed. I agree with all your points, Hedrick, especially the last one about the marketplace of ideas. That's the kind of system we need to have. And that's why I've studied Hannah Arendt, even going back and getting a master's basically in her at the new school. We need, we need a, we're in a pluralist society, so we need to have a multiplicity of ideas. But what I've seen, and then uh, again, having spent time in the military, but then for the Minnesota Secretary of State's office, uh, where I was the Help America Vote Act uh, administrator for the state from 2004 to 2008, what has been silent in regard to this, and I also recommend people read Sheldon Wolin, who coined the phrase inverted totalitarianism, which was in part against the money in politics. But what I saw at the Minnesota Secretary of State's office, and it was a continuation from this debating society, you can look it up, John Adams Society, was this uh, incredibly radicalization of the right, which people who read the Committee for the Republic email gets a sense that I'm pretty much against. And all of a sudden, we had coke funded organizations accusing the Secretary of State's office when, when it passed from the Republicans' hands, who had been a Cheney advocate, uh, into a very ethical Democrat's hands, Mark Ritchie, accusing him in Minnesota of having the most crooked electoral system in the country, et cetera, et cetera. It's incredible how this coke funded money was uh, 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 aggressing against what was in generally agreed was a best uh, electoral system in the country. I was the guy who took all the complaints of illegal voting in the state. And I was like the Mayflower uh, Maytag repairman. It was almost virtual silence. With, exceptional, with the exception of a few frivolous complaints that would come in. So, but yet in 2012, uh, Coke Money funded a, a huge campaign against the uh, Mark Ritchie, uh, accusing him of uh, suppressing the military vote, et cetera. All the time, these Republican and Coke funded organizations were constantly assaulting a, a genuinely clean uh, electoral system. Uh, so again, we, we need to, you know, not take the elephant in the room out, which is a radical right-wing politics that, that has come into effect. 
And even with all these reforms, and, and one final point, the money is funding what in Israel they call the battle for consciousness in our, you know, in our domestic politics. United States calls it, DOD calls it perception management. So this Sheldon Adelson money and Koch money, it's fun. And not to say that the Democrats are clean, but uh, from my experience, watching the electoral system from within the system, uh, it, it is the right wing money that has thoroughly corrupted this system uh, mm -hmm. to such a point that there's no such thing as elect reform that we're talking about because the, the, the people who want to control the system will not let it happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, I think um, I agree with everything you've said, Hedrick, but uh, we, we need to confront this elephant in the room in more ways than one, so to speak and realize that uh, you know, there's some extremely well-funded vested interests that are engaged in the battle for consciousness, which as much as we might like to think that each individual human being is thinking for ourselves, uh, as propaganda, psyops recognizes, we are subject to uh, you know, manipulation of our consciousness, which takes us, is taking us in this right way. Thank direction. you, thank you, Todd. Yeah, yeah. thank Thanks. you. So we, we have, uh, we have Francis Johnson here, who uh, is involved in uh, 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 the the only right the center uh, campaign finance group. Uh, Francis, can you you're you're actively involved in campaigns? Can can you unmute yourself? John Henry is somebody I introduced. Francis. I would never recognize that. I don't know who that is. I don't know. I see Francis here, but he's muted. Um. Uh, John, could uh, let me ask you this question, Rick, about finances, you know, the money. Um, isn't, don't you think one of the reasons why money spiked, um, even from the days of the robber barons, is because there's so much... In. This is, you're never going to forget this moment. breaking up a lot. I, I'm having trouble hearing you. Um, I, I was asking, Rick, don't you think one of the um, problems or one of the reasons why money has spiked um, so much in politics, even since the days of the robber barons, is because such an enormous portion of our GNP, 25% or more, runs through the federal government that you return on investment by buying the politicians since they control so much of the economy directly or indirectly has spiked. And that's why the money is there. If the government may, may seem counterintuitive, but the government didn't have much influence over the bottom line, which they do, perhaps there'd be less incentive to try to manipulate the election. I don't know. I don't know if you're in the oil industry, if you get oil depletion allowances, um, you know, that's not government money. It's a government tax relief that you're getting. Uh, it's that's a matter of policy. It's not a matter of the, the portion of the GDP that the government represents. If you're in the pharmaceutical industry and you can write off uh, untold uh, R&D expenses when you're actually paying much more in, in the uh, rebates to your in in buying back your stock, um, the ability to buy back your stock, uh, which was changed by uh, regulations uh, in the early Reagan administration, is much more important to you than probably the pharmaceuticals you're selling to the government. Uh, if you're in the financial industry, freedom from regulation, uh, the ability to not be taxed on your carriage trade. All that is probably a lot more important to you than whatever financial business. No, I, I don't. I, if you're in the military industrial complex, I suspect that what you say is true. Uh, there's no question that the government is spending an awful lot, is providing an awful lot of your not top line as well as your bottom line. You know, I think there probably are industries where what you said uh, is true. But I think there are other industries which put up enormous amounts of political money where I don't make the connection that you make. I see something else going on. Well, it's not, Rick, I'm, I'm agreeing with you that it's not just the value come government <coughs> spending printing dollars, so I think he's but it's the, yeah, he the authority through regulations, yeah, including taxes, yeah. taxes. I do too. the financial benefit can be the same or greater, even though it doesn't result yeah, well, in an expenditure of it. Obviously, if, it, if the government affects your taxes and affects your regulations, 
you know, then then it's going to matter a great deal to you. And particularly if you can find a way to write in, uh, I guess, somebody to help you write in clauses when they're passing one of these omnibus uh, continuing resolutions, the government can help you a lot. I mean, I think a lot of it is really um, quite transactional. Uh, I mean, people are looking, I mean, there's no question that the cost, and we look at the cost, you know, there's, what is it, 14, $14 billion or maybe $15 billion will have spent on this past election. And we look at that and say, that's horrific. That's a terrible amount of money. So the people who put up the money in terms of the amount of money they're making and dealing with, you know, it's a small percentage. I mean, it, it's real cheap stuff. I mean, if I can buy a, if I can buy the continuation of my oil, oil depletion allowances, I can keep the, make sure that the American government doesn't treat me as a pharmaceutical supplier the way the Canadian or the European governments treat the European a pharmaceutical firms. So I can do that, man, it's a bargain. But I don't think that has to do with the purchasing power, the GDP percentage of the government. It may, as I said, in the military industrial complex, I'll buy that. You know, maybe, maybe if we get a real big infrastructure program, then for the construction industry and the contracting industry, yeah, yeah I'll buy that. You know, there are places where the amount of money the government is spending actually affects the amount of money candidates can raise. But I think more of it has got to do with favors and tax breaks and regulations and, and relieving regulations, uh, Bruce. I don't, I don't think it's mostly I know, but, but politicians- I know where you want to go, but, but I'm, I'm going to disappoint you. Rick, that the incentive to give the money is the same whether the benefit is returned in terms of a tax break as opposed to a government oh, there's contract. There's no question about that. So then you're, you're agreeing as long as the government is the one that controls your bottom line, you're going to give money because you want to you be able to control them because they have an impact on what your return on investment is, well, whether it's through then tax. You're into, then you're into how societies are organized and how they, you know, how they tax, how they organize themselves, what their priorities are and so forth. And obviously, they're, they're, you know, from the from the Romans forward, there's been an interest in, in influencing whoever makes those decisions. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, but I thought you were saying something else, that as the government gets larger and its percentage of GDP gets larger, then there's more reason to give money. Yeah, probably, but I think that's minor compared to the, what I would call getting the favors you want and pre preventing the damage you want to avoid. I think, I think it's, more, it's more transactional. So. So, Rick, uh, uh, this has been a, a, a fabulous uh, salon. You've um, uh, this research you've done reporting is really uh, is terrific, and I re we really want to thank you for uh, for everything that you've done. And um, stay out there and keep digging. And um, uh, you've given us uh, a lot to think about in terms of okay. how we should uh, go about trying to reform. Uh, let me just say there is a website that I run called ReclaimTheAmericanDream.org reclaimtheamericandream.org. Uh, these issues, voting rights, gerrymander reform, public funding of campaigns, uh, those kinds of issues that are dealt with there. Uh, I got a YouTube channel called The People Versus the Politicians. Uh, I have, uh, as you said at the beginning, I have a, a video called The Democracy Rebellion, which brings together half a dozen of these stories. And you can actually see the people who are carrying them out. And so when they're all short segments, they're not really long, but you know, anywhere from six to 10 minutes. And so you can see that and uh, it's pretty good stuff. Uh, and it really does, it won't enhance the intellectual arguments you already understand, but it will give you a sense of the people on the ground that do it. And what's utterly amazing to me is, um, I started to say how ordinary the people are. Actually, they're extraordinary, ordinary people. I mean, they're really daring, gutsy, committed people who are as upset about the issues as uh, the wonderful people in the salon. And they have just said, screw it. Nobody else is going to do this. I got to go do it myself. And I mean, you meet the woman I met in, in Florida who organized the gerrymander reform campaign down there, she'll blow your mind. But she's just unbelievable. Another woman out in, in Washington State who was against Citizens United and big money against a Frank Loy would fall in love with this woman. She, Cindy Black. And if you just wouldn't believe the kind of people. Uh, and we've got assets. We've got real heroes like that out there. Um, we just need to, to connect really smart people with those in this group with those folks out there. 
Terrific. Well, um, Rick, maybe we, uh, when we send out the, um, uh, the, the video for tonight, we can, um, if, if uh, we can put, we can put all those uh, sites in the, uh, in, in the, um, the same email when we send the, uh, the, the video Great, recording. Out. Yeah. Terrific. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo, Rick. Oh, it was great Good to job, be with Rick. you all. You're, you're a great bunch to be with. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Keep fighting, Rick. Bye-bye. <laughs>